Hello and welcome to Living Word, growing a family that experiences every promise of God. You're listening to another life-changing word from Pastor Scott Anderson. For more information, visit our website at livingwordonline.com. Amen, amen. Come on, somebody out there. There's a Lulu in the house. If you're new and you're like, what in the world is this craziness? That's from Gulu, Africa, where I talked to some pastors, a bunch of them, and that's what they did. I like it. It's just fun and exciting. I brought it back to America. Come to find out it means I have victory over my enemy. So if you got victory over your enemy, be loud about it on three. One, two, three. <laughs> Give a big hand clap to our podcaster, our vidcaster, whoever's streaming us right now. Thank you so much, Heath, out in Nebraska for joining us, and uh, had a big win over Penn State. We love you. Appreciate you. Don't forget to subscribe to YouTube if you want, if you want to watch our daily Bible study, our Wake Up Show, and uh, it's every day. We pray over your day, but you know what's great is we'll take my message, we'll take Jason's message, and we'll go deeper with it, and it's about seven minutes long, and it really gets you fired up for your day, and all you have to do is go to YouTube, type in uh, daily Bible study, and we come up number uno, amen? That's, kinda, that's a big deal, number one. Joyce Myers, you number two. Keep trying. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> So George and uh, Martha are, uh, you know, they, they go to the fair every year, and every year Martha wants to go on a helicopter ride. And George is like, no, it's $100. She's like, it's only $100. George is like, $100 is $100. We're not going to waste money on a helicopter ride. Year after year, they go to the fair. Finally, they're ce- celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary, and and uh, there, and Martha's like, come on, it's our 50th, just let me, one helicopter ride. And he goes, No. And she's like, it's $100. What's the big deal? He's like, $100 is $100. Well, the pilot overhears, and he walks up. He goes, all right, here's the thing. I'll make you a deal. He says, if you guys can go the whole helicopter ride without saying a single word, without a scream or making a peep, he says, I'll give it to you absolutely free. But if you make a peep, then it'll be $100. George says, oh, yeah, we can keep quiet. That'll be no big deal. Yeah, we'll, we'll do it. So up they go in the helicopter ride. Now, the pilot's goal now is to get them to scream. And so he takes it. He's Boom, and he's banking left, and he's banking right. Takes it way up, and then he drops it way down, and he dives. He does this for 45 minutes, not a single peep. Finally, he gives up, and he lands, and he's like, I can't believe it. You did it. You went, you went 45 minutes without making a peep. And Martha says, well, I almost said something when George fell out, but $100 is $100. <laughs> Open up your Bibles. The first Samuel 22 one. We are in, um, I would say, a very exciting series called The Upper Hand, meaning that you and I have the upper hand. We have the winning hand. God has already given to us. If you read the Bible at the end, how many people know that we win? We win in the end. But here's the thing. I want you to realize that you don't have just the upper hand for the end, but you have the upper hand and the winning hand for life in general. That you have everything you need. God has given you all that you need to have a successful life on all fronts of life. But just because you have the winning hand doesn't mean that you'll win at life. Because if you don't play, you can't win. Anybody hear that somewhere? If you don't play, you can't win. And so if we don't play our winning hand, we can go through life with all the tools that we need to be successful, yet not have the success that God wants us to have in our life. One of my heroes, I'd say, growing up would be Bobby Fischer. I'm a a chess nerd. And so I I loved watching and going through Bobby Fischer games. And one of the games that I remember him talking about, and this is when Bobby was at the top of his game, world champion, and he was at the world championship. And his first match was against a no-name. And so, you know, because Bobby was number one, so this kid was one of the bottom uh, of the barrel, and, and, and this kid was just up and coming, and young, a uh, real youngster, nobody knew his name. And so they go through the, the game, and of course, Bobby Fisher is just dominating and dominating. Finally, Bobby Fisher takes one of his major pieces, one of his big pieces. And as you look at the board, you know, the guy did what you do in chess. In chess, when you're playing at that level, when you're down a major piece, you're going to save everybody time, you just tip your king over, and you give up and you forfeit. And so he tipped his king over and he forfeit. And Bobby always went through all of his games in great details. And then he, he'd document and talk about each of the moves. Well, what Bobby found out about a month later was that the kid 
was three moves away from beating Bobby if he had seen it. There was nothing that Bobby could have done to win that game if the kid would have kept on playing and would have saw it. He forfeited. Nobody hears about him because I guarantee if he would have beat Bobby, everybody would have heard about him. He had the winning hand. He had everything that he needed to win. But because it didn't look like it, he forfeited. He gave up. And many Christians out there, though you have everything that you need to have success in this life, many Christians stop playing the game of life. And in a way, they forfeit and they give up some of the great things things that God wants them to have in this lifetime. I want us as a congregation to to play. Can I get an amen anywhere out there? Come on, we're going to play hard. We're going to play all the way through. We're going to play with what God has given us. And even in the midst of a storm, even when it looks like we are losing, we know that I've been given everything that I need to win in this lifetime. We're going through the story of David. And one of the things that I like about David is, at least I can, I think most of us can see ourselves in David. We can see what David's going through and be able to identify and go, yeah, I've been there and I felt that and and I've experienced some of those things. And so today we're going to go through and I'm hoping that you'll be able to parallel a lot of things that have happening or happened in your life to what's going on with David and see what David had done and begin to apply it to our own lives. And so we remember last week that Saul had just thrown a spear at David and so off David goes and he makes some decisions now. Not out of faith, but he begins to make some decisions out of fear. I don't know about you, but I think I have. I think in this room, most of us, if not all of us, have sometimes because things didn't go our way, we begin to not walk by faith, but we begin to walk by fear. Fear or faith are going to design your life. It's going to build your life. If it's faith and hope in what God can do and the difference that God's going to make this week, then faith begins to bring to me everything that I need and everything that I believe. But the opposite of faith is fear. Fear is a belief. And if I believe that tomorrow is not going to get any better and this week is not going to get any better, then fear begins to shape and bring to me everything that I'm afraid of begins to come into my world. And so you find David who's making some decisions in fear. And we see here in 1 Samuel. Throw it up there for me, Bits. 1 Samuel 22.1. David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. Now, this cave in verse 3 and verse 4, you can see it in your Bible there, is called a stronghold. David escapes from what's going on and he escapes into a stronghold. And what I want you to see today is so many of us, When we go through a pain and we go through a a hurt or something big happens in our life, a trauma, we, just like David, we escape to our cave and we build up a stronghold in our life. It's a defense mechanism. Okay, they broke my heart, they cheated on me, they, they left me, and so now I don't want to ever go through that again, so I have to build up a stronghold. I have to Put up some walls. I got to put up some barriers in life. I got to hold people off at at a distance and I got to put them off in this way and I can't give my heart away anymore and I got to be very guarded in life. And so I build a stronghold in a sense and I had hopes and dreams and they were, they were just crushed. And so I got to make sure that I, I don't, I don't dream too big again. I got to make sure I don't hope too big again because I don't want to have to ever go through that, that, that hurt or that loss and that pain again in my life. And there was abuse that happened maybe for some of you as a child, a teenager, or as an adult. And what they say with abuse victims is that pain and that trauma makes them go to an emotional stronghold. And they build up these large walls and these large barriers just like David did. David's feeling hurt. He's feeling alone. And so he builds up walls and he builds up barriers. And though he is safe in the cave. How many people know that the stronghold that you build to keep you safe can end up being the thing that keeps you in captivity in life? David cannot become king in the cave. You cannot experience God's best in your stronghold. You can't experience it in your cave. And the thing that you meant to protect you is literally keeping you as a prisoner away from what God wants to bring into your future and into your life. And this is where David is. And David has become a victim, in a sense. And that's kind of what happens to us. We become victimized. And, and, and Pastor, this happened, and that happened, and this got crushed. And we become victims to our circumstances. But God didn't call you to be a victim. He called you to be a victor. 
and to have victory over your problems. Not to live a life in the past and the fears of what has hurt you, but instead to live with God's hope in your heart of what God can bring to you in your future. And so David cannot be king here in the cave as long as he stays in this stronghold. I want to see, uh, show you here in Psalms. Go with me to Psalms 142. In the Psalms, this is where David was writing this psalm while he was in the cave. Now, what's interesting about this is this does not sound like the same David who just earlier had defeated Goliath. The same David that in the midst of a giant said, hey... Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that dare comes against the name of the Lord? Surely by the end of the day, his head will be at my feet. That's a victor. But now you hear a different tone to what's going on with David. I cry aloud to the Lord. I lift my voice to the Lord for mercy. I pour out before him my complaints. Before him, I tell my trouble. When my spirit grows faint within me, it is you who watch over my way. In the past where I walk, people have hidden a snare for me. I've got all these enemies around me. Look and see, there is no one at my right hand, and no one is concerned for me. I have no refuge. No one cares for my life. I think that, I mean, if we're all being honest, I think we've all gotten to that place where it felt like, hey, no one cares. You know, I give and I give and I do. But I look around and really no one is around me. And see, this can happen when we build a stronghold like David did. And we get ourselves into this cave and we begin to operate more out of fear. And for those two hours in 2008 when I lost everything, you begin to feel like a victim. You begin to feel like no one's around. And where's all the people that used to be around? And how come nobody cares about me? And how, how come nobody is there for me in my life? And so David is going through the exact same thing. And here's the thing that I want you to see. Go into that next verse for me. Uh, Betsy, that there were people in David's life Actually, go, we can go, well, this is, I mean, all those who were distressed or in debt and discontented gathered around him and became their commander. About 400 men were with him. You see in verse 1, if they go back to that, his parents were with him. So he had people around him, yet he said, there's nobody on my right. How many people know that you can have a lot of people around you, surround you, who do not support you. There's a difference between being surrounded and being supported. And sometimes I'm like, I just need to be supported by somebody. I need somebody just to give a care about me and what's going on in my life. And David is in the same place. Once again, I said, we all find ourselves in these places where we begin to feel, what in the world? Because I think David's not surprised by the enemies around him. And I think most of us, we're not surprised when there's people against us. That's no surprise. But we're more surprised like David was surprised that nobody was with him. That the people that he laid his life down for did not have his back. I had your back with Goliath, but not nobody came to have my back. I do all these things for people and nobody does anything for me, right? I think that we can get to the place in our lives where we're like, hey, you know how many times that I prayed for so-and-so and I stopped and I talked on the phone about their stupid problems for an hour and a half, a few nights in a week, right? But nobody has time to answer my phone. Nobody has time to answer my text. Nobody likes my post where I poured out my heart and my soul. How come, where's people for me in my life? I helped you move. Nobody helped me, but, right? You began to go off. <laughs> right? And you begin to feel like David is. I'm surrounded, but I am not supported. His own parents are there, right? In verse 1, it says that his parents showed up and his brothers showed up. Oh, good for me. My brothers who hate me, right? Didn't David brothers? Every time you see him, they're talking about how proud he is and go home, you big little shepherd boy, and they were just mean to him. His own dad didn't invite him to the draft party, right? When they're getting drafted for a king, his own dad didn't even think about him. And so you find out, and then you see the 400 guys that are in the cave. They're distressed. They're bums. They're, right? He's like, really, God, this is what you brought to me. I'm supposed to be a king. I'm supposed to be the king. I'm so, God, I'm supposed to have abundance. I'm supposed to have peace and joy. I'm supposed to have fulfillment. I'm supposed to have your best in your life. And I'm trapped in a stronghold, trapped in a cave, not experiencing God's best in my life. And David is feeling this. He's feeling what we've all gone through in our life. And so he begins to pour these things out. And here's the thing that, and this is the big one. I'm going to give you number one. Because David comes about in verse 5. We'll get there in a second. Number one, people cannot be your support system. Now, when I got, grabbed a hold of that, it was a life changer for me. 
It was, it, it, it was a game changer. Because I think that we all live in a world where we're trying to get people to support us and to care about us. But here's the problem. I'm trying to get you to care about me, but all you care about is me caring about you. And I'm angry because I'm trying to share with you my problems, but you don't care about my problems because you want me to care about your problems. But I don't care about your problems because you don't care about my problems. And if somebody cared about me, well, you don't care about me. I don't care about you. You don't care about me. Nobody cares about anybody because everybody's trying to get everybody to care about them. Let me tell you about my problems. No, no, let me tell you how much bad, worse my problems are. Well, let me up my problems up. There we go, right? And we spend our world going around trying to get people to support us, trying to get people to love us, trying to get people to behind us. But while I'm trying to get you to love me, you're trying to get me to love you. And everybody is trying to get everybody to care about themselves, and nobody's caring about anybody. Here's the thing, and I use this all the time. People are people. I just you have to come to that, that people are people. Everybody's trying to make their life better. And in reality, you're trying to make your life better. And so when I'm trying to get you to support and you're trying to get me to support, nobody is supporting one another. And David has the same thing. Everybody in that cave is trying to suck the life out of David. Everybody in that cave needs something from David. When is I going to have one person around me that's giving to me? When is somebody going to care about me? When is somebody going to care about my needs? When is going to somebody care and really want to get to know me and who I am? That's how people are in this world. My dad has done judo most of his life. He's judo. Ha, ha, right? right. He, he used to do it. Uh, growing up, he, he'd have his friends over, and they'd have bricks, and they'd have boards, and he'd kick the board, and he'd break the board. And he was so into it, he, would, he actually had a board. Every house that we had, he had this board, had, and he wrapped wood in this little bit of cloth, and then he put it, and he'd go outside, and he would hit this board over and over again, his knuckles. And this is what my dad would do. Well, Trying to get into a little bit of good shape, I, I thought I'd do some, you know, just got a bag and do some boxing and some stuff, right? And so I got, I got the big punching bag, and, and so my dad was over, and I was, I was, he was holding it for me, and I was like, pop, 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 you know, hitting it. And, and so I hit it for a little bit, and I'm like, your turn, Dad. And so I, I'm holding the bag for my dad, and so my dad goes, he goes, pop, 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 and then he kicks. Here's the thing. We're not kicking. I didn't kick. There was, there was no kicking. We never talked about kicking. There was not supposed to be a kick. At 72 years old, my dad's kicking aim may be a little different than it was in his 30s and his 40s. Might be different. His knee hit the bag and his foot wrapped around the entire bag. And it hit me. Now, I want you to know, it didn't hit me here. It didn't hit me here. So I'm just telling you where it didn't hit me. The same kick that used to go through four pieces of wood hit me full force, sent me to the ground, don't remember much for a long time. <laughs> I do remember this. My dad over me, he's like, son, I, I'm sorry. And all I could say to him is, why? Why would you kick, dad? Why? We're not kicking. He's like, son, I'm so sorry. It's just what I always hit and then I kick. I'm like, well, why? There's no reason to kick. Why? Why would you do that? He's like, I don't know, son. It's just in me. I'm like, I know, but why? You think five kids are enough? You don't want me to have any more children? Is that what we're doing, dad? You're like, he won't listen to me after three, so I'm going to take care of it. I don't know what's going on. It's subconscious. It's just in him, right? People do things not to be hurtful, not to be mean, not to care. It's just in them, and it just kicks you in a bad place of life over and over and over and over. Come on. You got those friends. The only time you hear from them is when they need something, right? Oh, they get on the phone. They act like, hey, how's your life? And you want to go, you don't care. Let's just get over and past all of this. You don't care how my life is, how my day is, how my family is. Can we just get rid of all of those formalities and just get to the end of the conversation where you tell me what you want? Just tell me what, and I'll tell you if I can do it or I can't. Let's just forget all of that. There's people in the world. It's just about what they can get out of it. And people cannot be your support system. Number two, God has to be your support system. There it is right there. See, 
God is the one that will give me peace that surpasses my understanding. He's the one that will fill me up with his joy. He's the one that shows me my purpose and my destiny. He's the one that cares for me. No matter I'm down or up or gone and doing great, it doesn't matter what I'm doing. It's not about what I do for God. It's about what God supports me in my weaknesses, in my strengths, in my good times, my bad times. I'm up or down. It doesn't matter. God is always there. And when God is my support and I get my joy from God and I get my peace from God and I get my fulfillment from God when I get filled up with that now I can be like David I can give to all those that are around me who do not have the peace and do not have the joy and do not have the fulfillment because they're trying to get from me that's all right because I am filled up with everything that I need to be the joy in people's life to be the hope in people's life to be the fulfillment in people's life It's a shift in the mentality that I don't have to get from you because I've already got everything that I need. And so then when you need to get, because you have not learned to get from here, I can give to you until you see the light. And then you begin to get from God. And now you begin to give to the people in your life. Everybody in David's life, they were broke. They were down. They had nothing going on. right? You see, it says they're despaired and they're in debt. Yet these are the ones that David gave to. He said, God, watch what David does in verse 5. I cry to you, Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. You see then, right at that moment, the entire uh, chapter begins to switch. It went from I'm a victim and nobody cares to God, you are with me. And when you're with me, it doesn't matter who's against me. And he begins to draw his strength from the Lord. He begins to get that energy from the Lord. And then he begins to pour it out on everybody that God has put into his life. And these people who were the rum dums, and they were, right, They were the bottom of the barrel. They ended up being David's mighty army. And the ones that he poured into were the ones that took him into the throne room. They're the ones that took him and got him his crown. They're the ones that tore the heads off of lions and off of bears who would lay down their life for David. And the people that God has put in your world, when you begin to get God to fill you up and you begin to put into their lives, they will be the ones that will help you attain all of God's promises and blessings that he has for your lifetime. Can I get an amen anywhere in this house? They're the ones that'll give you the stuff that you need. You know, I was, this last week was crazy, I told you, in the ministry time. It was a crazy week. Wednesday to Friday, it was crazy. Crazy storm, hurricane, whatever you want to call it. It was just crazy. 18-hour days, going and going. I had to go off to about a dozen different places in those days. And uh, six of the places that I went, usually it's, it's a couple, and I want you to understand that I love this with all my heart, so don't get the wrong idea what I'm saying here. I do. I look forward to this. I love to be in an IHOP and somebody walk over and need some prayer. I do. That's what I do because you're not stealing from me, but instead I get everything I need from God, and I love to give it to you. I love it to give it to But in six places, now remember, I'm going in a storm. I had people come up, hey, Pastor, how are you doing? I'm like, I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Hey, Pastor, can you pray with me? Of course I can. I love to, right? I pray with him. And off I go. And as I was driving, God reminded me of this. He says, in the midst of your storm, you have no trouble loving and giving to people that I send into your path because I'm the one that fills you up. See, people are my, see, if people were my source and my support system, you show up and say, hey, I need prayer. I'm like, no, I need prayer. You pray for me. I'm in a storm. I need some strength. I need some comfort. I need some love. But guess what? I get my comfort, my love, and everything that I need from my God. And my God fills me up so that when I go out into the world, I can give my overflow of my joy, my overflow of my peace, the overjoy of long suffering. I can give it into anybody who happens to need it in their life. And you watch the same thing for David. Go to the next verse. Watch David. From from there, David went to Moab and said to the king of Moab, Would you let my father and mother come and stay with you until I learn what God will do for me? Are you kidding me? You're in the midst of a whole bunch of problems, and your concern now is your parents who had no concern for you? Here's the thing. Remember, David had a heart after God. David would do for those who would not do for him. He would lay down his life for people who would not lay down their life. And this is one of the key assets of why he had a heart after God. Remember, Jesus was known as the son of David. What did Jesus do? He died for people who killed him. 
He gave his life for people who would not give him anything. And this is our calling is to be like David, to be a heart after God, to be a group, a congregation who goes forth and it does not matter what you do for me. I'm going to find a way to do something for you. I, I know you won't lay down your life for me, but I will lay down my life for you. And I have God's source and his peace and his joy that flows out of me as the source of my fulfillment. And it makes it easy then for me to be a blessing wherever I go. Now watch here in verse 5. Actually, verse 4. Go to verse 4. So he left them with the king of Moab, and they stayed with him. And as long as David was in the stronghold, say stronghold. So David was in the stronghold. All right, this is where we're getting to. Everybody in this room, we have a stronghold in our life. Verse 5. But the prophet Gad said to David, do not stay. Somebody say, do not stay. Tell your neighbor, get out of the stronghold. The prophet knew that, David, you can't become king in your stronghold. You got to get out of your stronghold. You can't get God's best in your stronghold in life. Right? Somebody broke your heart and you got maybe a divorce. And so you, you went into your stronghold, into your protected place, and you become a prisoner of this. And you're like, well, I'm just not ready to date. I'm not ready to get out there. And I know he wants, but she wants. But you know what? I just, my heart, I got to guard my heart. I got to let my heart heal. Okay, how long has it been? It's been three years. Are you kidding me? It's been three years in the cave. Get out of the cave. I had my heart ripped out four days before I met Holly. I was in the cave for a day or two at tops. I had to get out of the cave because I didn't want to spend one more day away from the person that God had for me in my life. Why would you want to spend one hour in the cave, one moment in the cave? I got love. I got hurt in love. Yeah, love again and love again and love again because God is the source of my love. He's the source of my fulfillment. He's the source of everything in my life. It's time to get out of the cave. Come on, somebody say, get out of the cave. Get out of the cave. Come on, I can preach this stuff. Get out of the cave. Somebody in here needs to get out of the cave. You're dealing with your, your shyness, right? Because you've been pushed away. And I got to push you away before you push me away. And so I've got my stronghold of shyness about me. I got to be very protective. But once again, it keeps me from getting to the level of relationships that I need in life. And the very thing that I protect myself so that I don't get hurt keeps me from having the relationships that God wants me to have. It's all fear-based. See, I'm in fear that you're going to hurt me rather than in faith that God can make a great relationship and bring the right people into my life. You got anger as a stronghold in your life. And you know what? You have a fear of losing control. So anytime it looks like you're losing control, you got to escalate and you got to get angry. You got to get mad, right? And you got to push back hard. But that's not it. See, once again, you're trying, things are trying to give you your peace. God gives you your peace in any storm that you have. I got to get out of that stronghold so I can develop the relationships that God wants, so I can act in a cool mind, so that I can have God's mind about me wherever I go in this life. You got to gossip is your stronghold. Because if I can make people think bad about somebody else, you may think good about me. I elevate myself by putting other people down in my life. It is your stronghold because people have hurt you, so now I got to hurt other people. But you are not called to hurt other people. You are called to give them some uplifting, to give them some hope, to give them some encouragement. So your stronghold keeps your relationships at a level that you weren't designed. You're a pessimist because life has always thrown you down. It's always thrown you down. And so you know what? I got to be real, Pastor. I just got to be real. Tomorrow, I just got to be real about it. See, once again, it's all based out of past fears of being a pessimist. And so you can't walk by faith. You're walking by sight of what happened in the past. And your stronghold, though it keeps you from being surprised by the bad things of life, it keeps the good things that God wants to bring into your life from coming forth out of your faith should be producing God's greatness. And so you got to get some hope in your life. you got to come out of the cave and realize it's a sunny day, that it's a blessed day, that it's a prosperous day, that God's hand is upon me, and I'll overcome whatever is in front of me, whatever is going on. You're carrying stress in your life. See, stress is your stronghold. 
Some of you have a hero complex. Well, the job couldn't do without me. And so I got to do everything. I got to handle everything. And so you carry all of the stress because, once again, you are the source, but God is my source. I got to give my stress to him, my anxiety to him. I don't need to carry it. I don't need to stay in the cave of stress and worried anxiety. The world will be fine, right? You can't do it all, but you can do it all through Christ Jesus that strengthens you. You got to learn to get out of that cave and begin to take a deep breath and go, you know what? God, I can't do this, but you can do it through me. I'm going to give it to you. I'm not, because you know what stress does is it shuts down the right side of your brain. And on the right side of your brain, you can't create ways to get out of the stressful situations that you're in. So the stronghold that you use is exactly the thing that keeps you in prison in the things in your life. You are a drama person. You need drama in your life. If you ain't got drama, you're going to create some drama subconsciously. Everything's got to be drama. This person and that person. Because if you don't have drama, then you have no one to blame. And so i got to be able to blame you and blame you and blame you and blame everybody around for the problems in my life. See, because once again, it's about people. But God is your answer and your solution. If I can come out of the cave and realize that I don't need some drama in my life, I just need to have some more faith in what God can do in the midst of whatever drama that I have in my life. Some of you out there... Unforgiveness is your stronghold because you're afraid that if you let it go, that they're going to get away with it. So I have to carry it. But God says, give it to me. He says, I take care of it. I take care of it. You don't need to hold that off because now I'm in prison. My relationships, nothing can grow in life because I have this unforgiveness on the inside of me that keeps me as a prisoner from growing in my relationships, growing in your marriage because of something that happened 10 years ago, something that happened 20 years ago, something that happened when you were a child and it has imprisoned you in such a way that you can't break free and enjoy the relationships to the level that they're supposed to because I can't trust you because I'm still harboring things that happened to me way back in the back. And when I learned to let go of the strongholds, and this is what I'm going to show you, because I'm not just going to tell you about the strongholds and not give you the option. Today, we're going to break off the strongholds in your life, and I'm going to show you how. Now, hold on. Watch this. You know, your stronghold was created out of a big emotional thing that happened. Emotions create strongholds in the same way that emotions break us free in some ways, and I'll show you how. An emotional moment is what brings change. When we have a big emotional moment, it's when change that happens for a lifetime. I know you're sitting down, but you're going to end up getting up here in a second anyway. That's all right. Though. You, stay, you sit down. Here's what I want to do. I know it's crazy. The ushers are going to go nuts. But if, if you want, I want to have an emotional moment with you, and I want you to come forward and line up if you want to get some strongholds free today. I'm going to talk about what to do, but then I'm going to pray over you. Come on, somebody up there. Come on up. Come on up. Just fill it up. I know it's going to get crazy up here, and I'm okay with that. It's going to get a little close up here, and I'm okay with that. You got a stronghold of anger. You got a stronghold of jealousy. You got a stronghold of stress and anxiety. You got a stronghold from the abuse that happened. You got a stronghold of unforgiveness in your life. You got a stronghold uh, uh, of manipulation. You got a pessimist thing about you. Whatever it might be. I get it. I can pray with you from the, wherever you're sitting so you don't have to come back up here. That's all right. We can do that. But I do believe in the emotional moment of coming forward and having this moment together, this change together, something that you will remember a lifetime, something that on, at 100 years old you'll tell your great-great-great-grandchildren. You didn't have to deal with the stronghold because your daddy dealt with it. How many people know the strongholds are generational? That you're dealing with strongholds sometimes that your great-great-great-grandma was dealing with. And today we break off the hold of the stronghold on your life and we go forth and get out of the cave. Somebody say, I'm getting out of the cave today. I'm getting out of the cave today. Now, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. This is the, there's a big thing coming, but I'm going to hit this one first because this is the simple one. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So here's the thing. The enemy wants to keep you in the cave. He wants to tell you about the cave. Keep you, why you got to stay in the cave. Why the hurts are in the cave. But your fight and your battle is in here. That every time the enemy tells you to stay in the cave, you give him a reason why you got to come out of the cave. 
Well, anger is just who you are. No, it's not. I was created in God's likeness and image. Devil, you lying to me. You got me in the cave telling me that I was something that I am not. I am made with God's love. I'm made with God's joy. I'm made with his peace. And so I begin to fight the battle of the argument of anger over that. Well, jealousy, you know, you just got to be, no, 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 no. Because God is my source. He is the source of my love. And so I don't have to be in fear of losing anything in life because God is my security. And so God's going to take care of me in the midst of whatever else. I don't have to hold on so tight that I squeeze the heck out of my relationships. I can let my relationships do this because I get my security from God. You begin, well, I'm just depressed, Pastor. You don't know. Yeah, your depression is your stronghold. And in the midst of your stronghold, you're trying to get your joy from everybody around you. You're trying to get your joy from your circumstances. God says, I am your joy. I am your peace. I am your fulfillment. You can't get it from Zoloft. Zoloft has no peace and joy for you. But God has everything that you need. And as long as you try and get it from others, it ain't never going to happen. You tell that enemy when he starts to give you a depressing thought, no! God is my joy. He fills me up. My cup runneth over. You'd be like David. David in the midst of his storm, he just prays God. God, you're a good God. You're so good to me. You love me so much. You love me too much, God. You're my refuge. You're my strength. All right, now watch this in verse 5. This is crazy. God showed me that. It just, I, and I can't believe it. So it says, he said, Get out of your stronghold. Go into the land of Judah. So David left and went to the forest of Hereth. I went, okay, cool. Hereth is part of uh, Judah, right? I said, okay. I said, God, what does Hereth mean? So I, I studied this. Now watch this. Hereth, a state of mind that cannot be penetrated by error or force, by resorting to praise and prayer and love, builds up a state of spiritual thought to which the will functioning in the selfishness of the personality cannot possibly gain access. Come on, somebody out there. Somebody needs to go to her rap. Come on. Somebody needs to go to her rap. Number three is praise, power, prayer, and love. That when I get up in the morning, that I can get myself out of my stronghold by being like David and praising, this is the day that the Lord hath made. At lunchtime, God, thank you so much. You're so good to me. Your love just overflows me in every area. At nighttime, God, what a great day it was. And I praise, but then I give my stuff, not to other people, but I give it to God. David says, I give you my complaint, God. I could complain to a bunch of people. Wouldn't do no good because they got their own complaint. But my complaints go to you, God. I'm going to pour out my heart to you, God, because you have the answer. You have everything that I need. And then I'm going to take all that I've been given, and I'm going to love that, God, you are my source. You fill me up. I then take what I'm full of. And I begin to pour it out into the lives and the hearts of the people that you have brought into my life. And when I begin to do that, the very people in my life that are taking from me end up being the people that help me re reach my purpose and my destiny. They are the ones that are stepping and helping and fulfilling. And they're doing all that they need that I have stepped out of my stronghold. I go into harass. Somebody say, I'm going to harass. I'm going to her wrath. Dearly Father, Lord, in the name of Jesus, we pray for everybody that is up here today for the strongholds in their life, for the addictions in their life. Addictions are just ways that they're trying to get their needs met when their needs are meant to be met by you. I no longer have to get my needs met out there somewhere, but right now my needs get met by you, that you fill me up with your strength. You fill me up with your love. You fill me up with your peace. You fill me up with your joy, with your fulfillment, Lord. I go forth into her wrath today. I will not stay another day in my stronghold. I will not spend another day in my, in my cave. I will not spend another day away from the relationships that you have, away from the love that you have, from the people that you have in my life, that I'm going to pursue the crown. I'm going to pursue the glory. I'm going to pursue your will for my life. I'm going to pursue your best for my life. I'm going to get out of the cave. And I'm going into a rest where the enemy Well, thanks for watching. We hope you enjoyed today. It was awesome. We had fun. Yeah, and we we're going to continue so on this message, right? We do on our daily Bible show. We're on our, it's called Wake Up, 
And uh, you can text and get on a little subscription that every day we send you a text, you click on it, and uh, we just continue what we talked about on Sunday. That's right. That's it's right. so fun. We do a new scripture. We'll pray over your day. Like five minutes it's to great get time. you energized for your day. And if you receive something today, we, 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 we would just ask that you give back, right? When we, my mama taught me that. If you're going to receive something, you always you give. give. You always give. And, and, and apply your faith to your seed. You start something with a seed. Maybe you're getting ready to start a business. Maybe you're starting something new in your life. Maybe this message is bringing something new to you. Attach some faith to that seed. Where we start with a seed, we finish with a tithe. Make sure your tithe goes to your local church. Help us propel this message and, and in, increase our reach to the rest of the what world. What we can do. That's yeah, right. and if everybody plays their part and gives, it allows us to reach a dying world. we got a couple great books, too. You can get them. That's right. Yep, I have teens. Get your hands on him on Amazon. I love him. It's a good book. It's Check a it great out on Amazon. Book. You've got a book called Eden. It's a fiction book. It's a fiction book for if you get this book. It's on Amazon as well. And uh, can why don't you lead them in the the prayer? You know what? If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's a free gift. There's not a whole lot of things that are free in today's world with no strings attached. You don't have to act a certain way. Mm. You don't have to somehow be perfect. All you have to do is believe, and you have eternal life. We know it. You're going to mess up. We all mess up every day. But guess what? The Bible says that you can't get to heaven through your efforts or through your works. You get there through beliefs. And what happens is when I get saved and I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and then I don't come under that condemnation that I have to work my way into heaven, I begin to want to live a right life. I mm -hmm. live life at a higher level and that's the cycle that God wants. But the big thing is today is that we get you up in heaven. Say the prayer. Believe it, and you got it. Everybody out loud. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask you right now, forgive me of all my sins. I ask you to Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord and be my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Remember to be in church this weekend, wherever you live. Go to your local church. We're standing with you. We love you. God bless you. Thanks for watching. Be blessed.